here it's almost the 4th of july and this is when we celebrate why america is number one the every other nation in the world to the best of my knowledge right it depends upon you know shared racial religious ties you know people you know, tied together by history and heritage but not the united states you can just come to the united states and you can immediately become american so christopher cordwell makes this point in his book, The Age of Entitlement, right? Americans in recent years, right? We didn't used to boast about this, but recent years, Americans have been fond of boasting that unlike most nations, where it is heritage, history, and race that bind people together, the United States is a place that one can belong to regardless of your background. Anyone can come here and become American, American number one, number one, right? Now, there is a reason that almost all other nation states are not multi-ethnic, Right, there's a reason why most of those who have tried to become multi-ethnic countries have failed. In fact, we don't have any examples in history, to the best of my knowledge, where you have a nation state that's built up by one particular people, and then that people becomes swamped, and uh, most of the population comes from completely different people, and there isn't you know, massive turmoil and bloodshed. So we don't have any kind of shared heritage, history, racial, or religious ties anymore in the United States. So. Our shared heritage is absent, it's unrecognized, right? All the eggs of national cohesion are placed in the basket of the Constitution. Guys, we got our problems, but at least we still got the Constitution. Maybe the Constitution will hold it together. But here's the paradox. With the dawn of the Civil Rights era, the U.S. Constitution, the very thing that made it possible for this ethnically varied nation to live together, has essentially been replaced by the Civil Rights Constitution. So what can hold us together? I'm thinking maybe a 4th of July declaration. Welcome to Craftery, crafts plus history by PragerU Resources for educators and parents. Today is special because I've got friends with me, Will. Hello. And Amala. Hi. All right, you two, do you have any idea what we're doing here? No I have no idea. idea. Good. <laughs> Today is a little bit different than a regular craftery because instead of a craft, we're actually hosting a 4th of July declaration ceremony For you, have you ever heard of a 4th of July declaration ceremony? I haven't. You haven't because it's something very unique to PragerU. This is a party that you can have at home with your family and friends. It's a ton of fun and it's really special to do for our nation's birthday. Okay, here's what you need. Iced tea, salty pretzels, strawberries, blueberries, whipped cream, a small bell, an American coin, any American coin, and a printed Declaration of Independence. So this short ceremony teaches us the meaning of Independence Day and reminds us how lucky we all are to be Americans. We are lucky, right? Yes, Yes, we are. Oh, very lucky. lucky. Okay, are you two ready for all of this? Let's go. Let's go. A great way to start this party is to remember that before America was a nation, it was a... Dream. dream. It was a dream, yes. It began with the pilgrims in 1620 who fled Europe so they could be free. I think they meant to say that before the United States was a nation state, it was a nation of a particular people, right? At the time of the Declaration of Independence, Americans were 85% from England, right? So the United States of America was created by a particular people with a particular people in mind, right? They created the United States not for the world's refuse, but for themselves and for their posterity. Free to practice their religion as they saw fit. They built lives in a land with limitless opportunities. About 150 years later, Americans were ready to break away from the old world. 
And on July 4th, 1776, our founding fathers took action and declared freedom from the tyranny of the King of freedom. England. Yes! Yes! <laughs> Let's go. America. Now, we cannot forget that thousands fought and died for the freedom and liberty we have now. And that's where we are. So, Wait, did uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands die for the freedom and liberty that we have now, like the freedom to be trans and to have same-sex marriages? Or did they die for a particular people? So in my flawed understanding of history, right, people fought for the United States and died for the United States to protect a particular people living in a particular land, not for abstract values like freedom. Pop quiz, Amala. Why is America different from all other countries? So, in 1776, most countries were based on nationality, religion, ethnicity, or geography, and America was based... Wow, how primitive is that? Man, just imagine having a nation-state based on shared heritage, right? I mean, that's the way the United States was until the 1960s, right? By the 1960s, America was more cohesive than it had ever been before. Right? We had higher social trust, higher social cohesion than we've ever had before. And then we very quickly blew it up with civil rights legislation. But hey, maybe we can get it all back together with radical love, inclusion, and constitution and do a 4th of July declaration ceremony. And maybe this will overcome you know, our lack of racial, religious, historical, and heritage ties. It's on a set of ideas. That's right. And that's... Wow. So America is just based on a set of ideas. I, God, I'm so primitive. I thought America was created by particular people in a particular time and place, uh, created for themselves and for their progeny, which sounds kind of blood and soil nationalism to me. But hey, I want to get educated. That's why I told you this is why we brought the friends, because friends know great stuff, especially you two. <laughs> Will. Yeah, I think they died so that wealthy actors could dip gerbils into cocaine and let them run up their backsides. I think that's why so many American soldiers fought and died. What are those ideas that make America so special? You can see them on every coin. You have e pluribus unum, liberty, and in God we trust. So think about your own family. Is what makes your family strong? Is it shared values? Do you have like shared slogans? Does that you know, knit your family together, right? Do you love each other because you have shared rituals, because you have like shared allegiances to particular texts, because you share political, religious, cultural beliefs? Is it shared ideology that uh, knits your family, extended family or community together? Or are you tied together by something more primitive, such as uh, blood ties, shared history, heritage? Yes, liberty, of course, means that liberty. we're free to pursue our dreams and work hard to be as successful as we can. In God We Trust, Amala, I'll let you take this one. It means that our rights are given to us by God. That's right, and no human can take away our rights. And e pluribus unum will means... From many one. America is made up of all sorts of different cultures, ethnicities, religions, but we all come together to make America what it is today. Yes, and it is unique. So, are you ready for the treats? Yes. Been ready. Yes, been ready. Okay. All of these things here on well, our Jen, table, things that you can put on your table, symbolize America's Declaration of Independence and the Revolutionary War that followed. So let's start with a toast with our tea. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. We drink our sweet iced tea to remember the Boston Tea Party when patriots dumped British tea into the ocean instead of paying unfair taxes. And they did this so that one day they could transition their gender and have same-sex marriages and stuff gerbils up their backside. To King George. Cheers. Cheers. And everybody Cheers. take a sip. That was more than a sip, Will. It's good tea. <laughs> it's all right. It's a party. <laughs> pretzels. Now, pretzels remember the suffering of the salty tears of soldiers during the hard... So, seriously, do you think this would be more effective at knitting the United States together, a nation of about 330 million people, as opposed to shared racial, religious ties, shared ties of heritage and history? Which do you think would be more powerful? So, Dennis Prager, the one who came up with this 4th of July Seder, right, he was for... You know, massive immigration to the United States. He doesn't believe in the importance of, you know, shared 
racial ties, shared genetic ties. He doesn't believe in the importance of blood. He, he believes in values. He believes that value is far more important than blood. Harsh winter at Valley Forge. The army was, of course, led by George Washington. Everybody take a bite. See the salt? Powerful. The salty tears of the soldiers. Salty That's what we got to remember. Powerful. And another sip of the tea. Got to wash, <laughs> wash down the salt. <laughs> you got it. Our bell. Now we ring a small bell to remember Yay. when our great Liberty Bell, now in Philadelphia, rang to proclaim the surrender of King George's armies. Woo! Woo! <laughs> wow. <There it> goes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now the best part, the part you two have been waiting for. We eat strawberries and blueberries and whipped cream to celebrate our American flag. Now, we know, of course, that the colors of our flag are red, white, and blue. Right. What does red stand for? Hardiness and valor. Yes, it means we're strong. What does blue stand for? Justice and perseverance. Yes, and white stands for purity. Okay, guys, go. Oh, gosh, this is what I'm going to be doing tomorrow. How about you, man? I really think this could help bring America back mm. together again. That's right. amazing. Tastes like America. <laughs> America number one. Now, we know that America is not perfect, but our ideals, opportunities, and history of always wanting to become better are things we can all be proud of, yes? Yes. And we are definitely. proud to be Americans. Of course. Of course oh, we are. So we've got one last thing to do. Sign our names on the copy of our Declaration oh, of yeah. Independence. Ladies first, Amala. Okay. <laughs> Yay! Jill, that is a fantastic signature. Yes! Wow. And that is our 4th of July declaration ceremony. But okay, so compared to primitive ties of, you know, religion, race, history, heritage, I mean, what do those traditional ties... Uh, how do they compare with something like a 4th of July Seder? Man, that's powerful. Well, the, the doggone problem, guys, is the left is destroying American identity. And how do I know? Because uh, Dennis Prager told me so. If Americans don't embrace some basic moral principles as their culture, mm. the country is over because this country is not homogeneous like Denmark or Norway. The country is heterogeneous ethnically and racially and in every other way the human condition comes. So it is the only way America can survive is if everybody assumes a strong American identity, which the left is destroying. And uh, don't forget, down on the lower right, this is coming to you from the Pain-Free Relief Factor Studio. What's to say? And as a result, you don't have America anymore. From many we, isn't that amazing? That was the name, I think, of his column. Or certainly this, that, was the, that was the topic of his column. Wow. Guys, if the left succeeds in destroying the American identity, we will have nothing left. Dennis tells us the only way America can survive. I saw it early. That, uh, I want you to know. He saw it early, right? He was far seeing, right? The, the wise great man saw it early. He sees things that you don't see. For example, he knows that we're going through a civil war right now. Could it, could it happen here? Could Nazi Germany happen here? Dennis Prager has written a column recently. It is happening here, right? We're, we're practically building Auschwitz and Beverly Hills as I speak. What brings me zero satisfaction with myself. So I'm not, I'm not bragging to you. I saw not it early. bragging. I'm only saying that I did see it early because I think clearly. And I have a strong moral Geiger counter. And whenever it comes near the left, it uh, pulsates. People want to say, oh, look, you know, I don't like either extreme. This is, this is the lazy way of not confronting evil. Well, it's on both sides, really. And when was the last violent demonstration on the right? So then people talk about Oklahoma City. You have individuals who do evil with every, every single doctrine on earth. But, but as a movement, tell me when the last right-wing conservative violent demonstration took place. When the Tea Party demonstrated in... Uh, January 6th, but uh, in fairness to Prager, this was recorded July 2nd, 2020. In large numbers against Barack Obama's policies. It cleaned up after itself. Remember that? They left the grounds clean. Did you see how these thugs who made the uh, chaz, buzz, flues, did you see how they left it? The garbage heap? These are the scum of the earth. And if you can't say that, it's because you're a coward.
people don't stare at evil. It's another one of my biggest views about life. Remember, I've always said, it's, the evil is not dark. Evil is so bright, people can't stare it in the face. I wrote a column years ago, the left fights statues, the right fights evil. On the left, there's greater hostility to George Washington than to the Iranian regime. Okay, does that give you an idea of how morally sick the left is? Uh, is that really true? Uh, I really haven't encountered that many leftists who are actively hostile towards George Washington. I mean, I'm sure there are some, and there are some who are actively hostile towards the Iranian regime, but most leftists, like most writers, they have other priorities than uh, some bloke from 270 years ago and uh, a regime in Iran. I don't know what stops people from, from the realization. I don't. I really don't. Uh, well, I don't fully. I do partially. The, the intimidation of the left, the indoctrination is so, is so acute that the fear, oh my God, I can't side with, with the right. That's what it is about, let alone with Donald Trump. Okay, so let's get uh, some, some background on this. Like, where's it coming from? So Dennis Prager, he does not believe in leaders, guys. He's just a humble servant of the truth. He has no interest in power. He has no interest in being a, a leader. He said on the radio June 28, 2011, about his time running the Brandeis Bardeen Institute from 1977 to 1983. Dennis said, individuals make and break the world. You know how many organizations I've seen that were great because its leader was great, and then the leader died or retired, and the place became nothing. It just shriveled up and died. Wait, whoops, sorry, I got it wrong. Dennis well, he's a, you know, leaders are vitally, vitally important. Leaders are everything. I know of what I speak on a personal level, right? Because when, when Dennis Prager left Brandeis Bardeen, Dennis says, the leader leaves and the people thought that what was great about the institution was its policies, its methodologies. It doesn't matter who led it. Well, when Dennis left, apparently, when the good leaders leave, the methodologies are useless, all right? Leaders are everything, guys methodologies, policies, institutions, nothing without great leaders like Dennis Prager. But on the other hand, March 23rd, 2010, Dennis said, leaders don't make America. Americans make America. I don't want leaders to shape America. God was entirely opposed to having a king. The Israelites asked for a king. Instead, he just wanted the prophets to tell people what is right and wrong and let them lead their own lives. I don't want leaders. I have a leader, God. We lead ourselves in America. The very notion that leaders will lead us is left wing. So Dennis does not believe in leaders, but Dennis really strongly believes in leaders. So which is it? Like trying to reconcile these. So it's kind of hard to avoid thinking that Dennis loves leadership when leadership allows him to assert himself above others. And Dennis does not like leadership when it allows others to assert themselves above him. So with almost all pundits, they, they say completely contradictory things. Frequently, you have to look for the magic decoder ring for understanding pundits and gurus. And the magic decoder ring is look for what's in their self-interest. So they will promote leadership if they see an opportunity for leadership for them. They will oppose leadership if it might lead to others having more than what they've got. It all comes down to self-interest. That's the magic decoder ring for understanding punditry. So this Dennis Prager notion that it is the left rather than the right who valorizes leaders is, once again, the opposite of reality. So I've been reading this terrific 2015 book, Key Concepts in Politics and International Relations, and Professor Andrew Haywood has an entry about leadership. So generally speaking, the principal supporters for the power and importance of leadership have come from the political right. Why? Because the right is strongly influenced by a general belief in natural inequality, right? Different people have different gifts. That's a right-wing belief. We're more at ease with hierarchy. And the right has a broadly pessimistic view of human nature and of the masses. So in its extreme form, this is reflected in the fascist leader principle, which holds there is a single supreme leader who alone is capable of leading the masses to their destiny. So the right often extols virtues of leadership, such as great leader mobilizes and inspires people who would otherwise be inert and directionless. This is just how Dennis Prager sees himself, particularly with his pitch for the 4th of July Seder. A great leader promotes unity and encourages members of a group to pull in the same directions, what Dennis Prager does. 
and strengthens organizations by establishing a hierarchy of responsibilities and roles. The people on the left usually warn that leaders cannot be trusted, and people on the left usually treat leadership as a basic threat to equality and justice. So why is Dennis Prager you know, so into a 4th of July Seder, but so opposed to ethnic you know, racial ties as the basis for a nation state? So back in 1995, in a lecture on the book of Exodus, Dennis said, the Jewish dream is that world not be based on blood ties, which is kind of weird because Judaism is a tribe. It is strongly, strongly based on blood ties. All right. And you can have a tribe that's strongly based on blood ties that also in, allows in you know, a few members from the outside, right? That uh, Judaism allows in a few converts does not contradict that this is primarily a tribe that is united by blood ties. So Dennis says, it is the only dream that will save humanity given the horrors of blood. Blood beliefs are the greatest source of cruelty in history. Yes, blood beliefs are also the greatest source of kindness in history. If you are not my blood, you're not valuable. Yeah, that's basically how the world works. And it is a source of tremendous kindness and a source of tremendous cruelty. So all the evils that Dennis Prager ascribes to the belief in blood are simply the flip side of genetic altruism. When parents prefer their own children to other people's children, they are preferring their own blood. When people love, they simultaneously hate that which threatens what they love. And uh, even Dennis recognizes this in his commentary on the book of Genesis. He says, every nation has a derogatory way of referring to other nations. Yes. So does genetic similarity predict closer ties than less genetic similarity? The evidence is clear. It is overwhelmingly. Right? So look at what happens to adopted children as opposed to biological children. Adopted children are much more at risk of violence and abuse than biological children. So adoptees were more likely than genetic offspring to receive public assistance, to get divorced, to be arrested, to complete fewer years of schooling, to require professional treatment for mental health, alcohol, and drug issues. Compared to genetic children, American adoptees have a higher overall risk of contact with mental health professionals, specifically for eating disorders, learning disabilities, personality disorders, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder. They have lower achievement, more problems in school. They're more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol, they're more likely to fight with or lie to parents compared to genetic children. So Dennis Prager advocates the proposition nation, a country united by shared beliefs, as well as the proposition family, parents and children united by shared beliefs and shared rituals like the 4th of July Seder. He wrote, as a father, my purpose is not to pass on my seed, but to pass on my values. So Dennis also does not believe that the family is a particularly big deal when compared to the ultra importance of the individual, which is a very liberal perspective. So in a 2005 lecture on Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 5, Dennis said, traditional life in Europe became, you are defined by your family. But that's not the way it ought to be. You are defined by you, not by your family. People think family is a big deal. It's not. It's a big deal? Well, who are you? Right? So Dennis says the individual far more important than the family. So I think this is a completely wrong belief. Right? So Dennis Prager and the classical liberal perspective coming from John Locke and company is that we are primarily individuals rather than members of families. Now, John Mearsheimer wrote about this delusion in his 2018 book, The Great Delusion, Liberal Dreams and International Realities. He says, my view is that we are profoundly social beings from the start to the finish of our lives and that individualism is of secondary importance. Yes, we are not primarily individuals with inalienable rights. We are primarily members of a nation, an extended family, a tribe. And whatever rights we are afforded will depend upon the circumstances that the tribe or the nation finds itself in. So liberalism, right, downplays the social nature of human beings to the point of almost ignoring it, treating people largely as atomistic actors, which is how Dennis Prager treats people, which is the very opposite of a traditional perspective, including the traditional Jewish perspective, which sees individuals as secondary to, to the family. So political liberalism is an ideology that is individualistic at its core and assigns great importance to the concept of inalienable rights. This concern for inalienable rights is the basis for liberalism's universalism, that everyone on the planet has the same inherent set of rights. And this is what motivates liberal states to pursue ambitious foreign policies, such as invading Afghanistan in 2001 and Iraq in 2003 to nation-build and bring democracy and gay rights to the Middle East. 
you know, public and scholarly and media discourse about liberalism since World War II places enormous emphasis on human rights, right? Human rights have come to define the most elevated aspirations of both social movements and political entities, state and interstate. They evoke hope and provoke action. Why has there been such enormous enthusiasm for human rights starting in the 1970s? Because leftists grew disillusioned with socialism and communism. They grew disillusioned with real-world politics. They wanted an illusion that they could embrace, not that uh, you can really have human rights outside of a state. Right? A state can afford rights to its citizens. That's about the extent of human rights. But uh, pursuit of human rights is, is a narcotic. It's an illusion. It's an intoxicating dream for leftists who become disillusioned with real-world politics. But Ms. Shaman notes, we do not operate as lone wolves. Like, I get excited when I read a great idea or have a great experience, largely because I can then talk about it with someone or talk about it with a group of people because I'm connected to people who I love and who love me, right? We, we do not operate as lone wolves, right? We are born into families, to social groups, to tribes, to societies, to nations that shape our identities well before we can ever assert our individualism, right? We, if we're halfway normal, we will develop very strong attachments to our family, to our group, to our tribe, and we will usually be willing to make great sacrifice for members of our in-group, right? We are tribal at our core. We are far more tribal than we're individualist. The main reason for our social, social nature is the best way for an individual to survive is to be embedded in a family, in a tribe, in an extended family, in a nation, in a society, and to cooperate with fellow members of your in-group rather than to act alone. Now, reason gets a very elevated ranking, but it's about the least important of the three ways that we determine our preferences, including our moral and political and cultural preferences. Right? Reason is far less important than socialization, which we get from our families, extended families, our tribe, and our community, from our in-group. Right? The main reason that socialization matters so much is that we as human beings have a long childhood in which we are normally protected and nurtured by our families and our extended families and our communities, right? And by our surrounding society. And we are almost always exposed to intense socialization. Now, not me. I was, I was kidnapped by, by uh, dingoes and I was just, you know, raised in the outback. But uh, normal people are raised by families, right? We begin to develop our critical faculties, you know, in our teens and 20s, right? We're, we're not really equipped to think for ourselves until well into our 20s. Right? By the time we reach the point where we can reason, right, family, society, community have already imposed such an enormous value infusion on us that to think that our reasoning can outdo our socialization is absurd. Right? The individual is also born with innate sentiments and proclivities that strongly influence how he perceives, thinks, and experiences the world around him. So people have very limited choice in formulating a moral code because so much of their thinking about right and wrong comes from inborn attitudes and socialization. So I believe John Mearsheimer is right here. I believe that Dennis Prager is just another guru spouting pseudo-profound nonsense. James Kirkpatrick argues, nor can any real family hold together on the ground of ideology. We love our parents and our children because they are ours, not because we agree with their views of the Constitution. So what best predicts a child's educational attainment, along with its future income and family stability, blood or home. Times of London reported, nature, not nurture, is the main determinant of how well children perform at school and university. So I read this on Lawrence Oster's side about Dennis Prager. He has a bizarre anti-biology approach to all ethical matters. He considers racism the most grievous human sin throughout history. And so anything at all that even acknowledges race as a reality is offensive to him. He was appalled at the baby Richard episode during the 1990s where an adopted child who had lived with his new parents from near infancy to around age four was given back to his biological father. So Dennis Prager describes the danger in thinking that blood is important. But he takes this view to such an extreme to say that blood is completely meaningless. He says many times if the hospital mistakenly gave him another person's baby and he kept that child for a day, he would not want to bring it back to switch it for his biological child, right? For every sane and decent person, there's a threshold of time after which the emotional connection overrides biology, but one day. And so this opposition to the slightest hint, the blood, descent, genetics matters in the definition of a people, particularly the Jewish people, right, is absurd. 
but rejecting the racial or ethnic biological genetic component of Judaism is is absurd right your your overall life chances can basically predict be predicted from your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents right the the individual doesn't make that big of a difference in his life outcome compared to what is genetically transmitted to him and the social competence that uh, he learns growing up. Independence Day in America, but on this special day, we find our beloved country more divided and then united. Here to talk about the road ahead and much more is the host of the Dennis Prager Show and founder of Prager University. Dennis Prager, thanks so much for being here, Dennis, and happy Fourth of July, which uh, I fear means something different to us than it does to a lot of other people. But I want to talk about uh, uh, racism and I want to talk about the theme and the undercurrent of all the protests and the burning and the looting and the toppling of statues. And that is that America is starting to recognize how racist she really is. Your thoughts? I wrote a piece a number of years ago that the greatest libel since the blood libel against the Jews in the Middle Ages, where Jews were accused of using Christian kids' blood to bake matzah for Passover, oh. that was the great blood libel. The second biggest libel that I am aware of on a national level is that the United States is a racist country. That is how profound a lie it is. And the reason it's so serious is now seen in the streets. It is seen in the lives of vast numbers of white and black and other kids in this country who believe this grand lie. There are so many obvious ways to prove how little racist this country is. Let me give you just a, a quick uh, review. First of all, like, there are so many hoaxes, really there are so many race hoaxes of a swastika on a dorm room, of a noose in somebody's room, uh, of, a, uh, of a gang rape against a, a black woman. Uh, all of them turn out to be hoaxes. So I have a question. Why are there so uh, or Jesse Smollett, obviously, the latest one with NASCAR. Why are there so many hoaxes if there's so much real racism? I'll bet you there wasn't one anti-Semitic hoax in Germany in the 1930s. You think any Jew made up an anti-Semitic incident? Of course not, because there was so much real anti-Semitism. You make up stuff when the real stuff doesn't exist. How about this? Two million black Africans, black Africans, I'm not even talking about North Africans who were Arab, black sub-Saharan Africans have moved to the United States in the last 50 years, been incredibly successful, one of the most successful immigrant groups. Why would black Africans move to a country that is racist. Are they stupid? Are they suicidal? They, they okay, so in the 1960s, we got the Civil Rights Revolution, and it was understood completely differently by American whites as opposed to American uh, blacks. So for whites, the Civil Rights Revolution was a really nice thing that uh, the majority population was doing for its minority population. But blacks understood civil rights completely differently. They understood white people, the majority population, passing civil rights legislation as an admission that they were guilty. And talk of reparations. All right, white people think that uh, by discussing reparations and possibly you know, giving reparations to, to American blacks, that that would just be a really nice thing to do. But it would just be more evidence to, to blacks that white people are guilty. So... For, for white people, the majority population, they thought by extending civil rights in the 1960s that uh, they were affirming the moral principles of the U.S. Constitution, you know, extending its principles to the American South where they'd never really been applied. There's Christopher Cordwell writing in The Age of Entitlement, but he said, black people and the most zealous among the civil rights activists of all races saw whites as having entered a guilty plea in the court of history, right? That's how it's perceived by the most zealous civil rights activists, that by passing civil rights legislation, the majority population is entering a guilty plea in the court of history and thus you know, completely repudiates the moral posturing on which the good name and good conscience of their constitutional republic had rested. Essentially, you are replacing the historical constitution of the United States with a new constitution, the civil rights constitution. And so when people talk about passing reparations for American blacks, uh, the majority population think, oh, this is just a really nice, generous thing to do. 
but the zealous activists of all races, along with American blacks, by and large, will see this as just further evidence of whites entering a guilty plea in the court of history. But uh, what about France, right? France maybe just needs more love and inclusion and, uh, and more emphasis on the Constitution. That's what uh, the Financial Times has to say here. Come on, right? France needs a new social mission by the editorial board. The senseless rioting that has brought mayhem to towns and cities across France shows signs of abating, although it could easily flare up again. The violence was sparked by the shooting dead by a policeman of a 17-year-old boy, Nal Mertzouk, as he accelerated away from a police check. The flames spread with alarming speed, fanned by social media, and shone an unforgiving light on deep-seated social tensions and political polarization. These problems require a comprehensive and sustained response from President Emmanuel Macron and his government. France's impoverished, ethnically diverse urban neighborhoods will otherwise remain a powder keg, prone to detonation. Macron deserves some credit for how he handled this crisis. Early on, he showed empathy for the dead youth, describing his death as inexcusable and inexplicable. The president's opponents and police unions decried these terms as a violation of the presumption of innocence and a betrayal of the police. But it was imperative to try to douse the fire. The government, including hardline interior minister Gérald Darmanin, have followed the president's lead and avoided inflammatory language. Macron also resisted demands to impose a state of emergency, which could have made things worse, while mobilizing vast police resources to contain the unrest. Macron's Jupiterian approach to power over six years has done much to inflame public opinion. But it is his opponents on the right, far right and far left who have exploited this crisis to fight their culture wars. Far left leader Jean-Luc Mélenchon refused to appeal for order, showing it is not just one extreme that endangers the republic. The victim's family, France's football team, and other celebrities showed more responsibility by pleading for calm. No grievance can justify a rampaging mob engaged in senseless violence. Ramming a burning car into the home of a district mayor south of Paris was pure criminality. Looters must face justice. Parents share responsibility for allowing thrill-seeking teenagers to join in. But France must address the causes of the sense of injustice and abandonment by the state in many communities, which are partly of Macron's making. France. Okay, so France must address uh, root causes, guys because apparently there are substantial numbers of people in France who feel that uh, the, the government is unfair. Well, guess what? Life is unfair. The government is going to be inevitably be unfair everywhere. So just as America's race problems are not unique to America, they are reproduced everywhere. You get those same racial combinations everywhere in the world. So too, France's race problems are reproduced all over the world. They have absolutely nothing uniquely to do with France. All right, so people who are prone to committing astronomical rates of crime and destruction in France, similar people, all right, are also committing astronomical rates of crime and destruction in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Australia, in other parts of the world. So... This idea that, uh, that there's something, you know, uniquely horrible about, you know, what's going on in, in France and if they just you know, in, ha had more, more inclusion, just, just created more opportunities is absurd. The only country where police brutality against black or ethnic minority men has sparked major unrest. Okay, so when the United States was testing out uh, nuclear weapons in the mid-1940s, they did that near Mormon communities. Why did they test out nuclear weapons near Mormon communities? Because they knew that Mormon communities were incredibly patriotic and would not make loud complaints about uh, the, the downsides of having you know, nuclear weapons exploded next door to their community. So different people react to provocations differently. So the people who've reacted in a criminal way to provocations in France, right, same type of people react in a criminal way frequently to provocations in Australia or in the United Kingdom or in the U.S., all right? This really has nothing to do with uh, you know, France not doing enough affirmative action. I mean, France and the United States have both tried to take on 
you know, ideological approaches to nation building. Hey, guys, we've got these shared values in common. You know, surely that, that would be enough to, to bring us together. But that's not how the world works. And I'm coming back here a thousand times if I have to, to point out that's not how the world works. I win. They lose. The U.S. and U.K. have witnessed the same. But France is singularly reluctant to face up to its policing problems, violent tactics during protests, poor training, systemic racial discrimination and far-right sympathies. Police rules on using firearms, relaxed in 2017, racial discrimination and... Macron's reluctance to tackle these issues for fear of looking soft on law and order has backfired, since it is the far right that has most to gain from further flare-ups. Macron, and the French political elite, have also failed to give proper attention and resources to the poverty, crime, racial discrimination, and educational underperformance that still pervade the banlieue. There are no simple solutions. Look, we don't know the root causes of crime, right? There, there are no effective, you know, proven methods for re reducing crime by addressing root causes. We do have a very effective method for reducing crime, and that is to lock up super predators, right? You lock people up who do bad things, you reduce crime. Ergo, you get to choose your crime rates by how rigorous you are in locking up people who do bad things, right? That unequivocally, empirically, reproduces itself again and again and again. Lock up bad people doing bad things, you will slash crime rates. And so th this, this Financial Times op-ed is absurd, right? You know, France must address the root causes of these riots. We don't know root causes for crime. We, we don't have a strong empirical basis for that. We can notice that certain groups commit astronomical rates of crime wherever they are in the world. So... It must not be the environment or policing or the schools or all these external factors when everywhere these groups go, they commit astronomical rates of murder and mayhem. France must address the causes of the sense of injustice and abandonment by the state in many communities. Well, every individual, every community can manufacture a sense of injustice and abandonment, right? You can manufacture a gigantic sense of injustice and abandonment and victimization by the state, by your family, by your community, right? That's to, to be human is to have some, you know, sense of victimization, right? That's uh, nothing unique to these groups that are committing the mayhem and the rioting. France is not the only country where police brutality against black or ethnic minority men has sparked major unrest. Yeah, well, a lot more you know, white men are the victims of police brutality in the United States, and yet... By and large, white people don't uh, rise up and commit astronomical rates of crime. So I don't think purported police brutality really has much to do with it. France is singularly reluctant to face up to its policing problems. Well, if the groups who are writing and murdering and committing mayhem in France have astronomical rates of crime and murder everywhere they go in the world, it really doesn't have much to do with France's policing. It doesn't really have much to do with France's police's violent tactics during protests or their lack of training or systemic racial discrimination or their far-right sympathies or police rules on using firearms relaxed in 2017, right? The groups that are rioting and murdering and committing mayhem in France right now are doing the same thing when they have the opportunity in the United Kingdom and in the United States. So there's nothing unique here about uh, France's reluctance to tackle root issues, right? There's nothing unique about America's race problems. Right? Everywhere in the world with, you know, America, the, the races that constitute America have similar problems, right? Absolutely nothing unique about America's race problems. The races that uh, combust in, you know, crime and mayhem in the United States do the same thing wherever they are in the world when given the opportunity. But according to here, the Financial Times, Emmanuel Macron and the French political elite have failed to give proper attention and resources to the poverty, crime, racial discrimination, educational underperformance that uh, pervade these uh, French hellholes. Well, there's no external answer for the low quality of life in some of these French ethnic communities. Either these various ethnic communities in France, the United Kingdom, Australia, the United States, they pick themselves up and start lowering the amount of murder and torture and rape they commit, or 
they will continue to create for themselves just absolutely horrific communities. Right? The, the answer is not outside of these communities. Right? The answer comes from inside these communities. That's the, that's the only answer. But maybe we just need a 4th of July Seder plate. Here's a lovely rabbi. Three months ago, I sat in the same seat with the same Seder plate as the rabbis and I created videos for our congregation for Passover. Now I am holding the Seder plate again, very purposefully, as it is almost July 4th. And I'm thinking of an incredible article written three years ago in 2017 on July 2nd by Alan Burdick and Eliza Bayard, who suggested that what we need for Passover, excuse me, what we need for the 4th of July is like Passover, a Seder. You can read the entirety of their article, which I think is very meaningful. And in fact, I'll be speaking more about it tomorrow night, Friday night, July 3rd, 2020, as I expand upon their suggestion. But at this moment, I wanna suggest that we ask each of ourselves, what is it about Passover that we can take with us to the 4th of July. We enjoy getting together, but we also have some serious conversations about our role and the responsibility of making freedom realized in our country. And also perhaps what are the symbols that we could put on a proverbial Seder plate for the 4th of July to symbolize what it is that we yearn for once again in our country. This is an unusual time vis-a-vis -vis coronavirus but it's not necessarily, unfortunately, an unusual time. Okay, this was recorded uh, July 2nd of uh, 2020. Here's another wonderful example of a fourth. Thank you everybody for coming today. Thank you everybody for coming today. And um, we're doing something different. The 4th of July usually is associated with being in a park, eating hot dogs, and um, hamburger and fireworks, but fireworks we can still do after we finish here. Like we yeah, that looks awesome. one of the signers to the declaration there were 56 of them and so you're each gonna you're gonna get a name tag so you need to put the name tag on William William you're yeah you're William and you're Samuel Huntington and you're both from uh, Connecticut okay, okay so we put your name tag on and then we're gonna give you you're going to each have one of these bio cards, and on the bio cards, there's a few sentences about each one of you. Okay, this is your bio card, and you notice that you're Samuel Huntington, and you're from Connecticut, and this is where you are in the famous painting. It shows a little red arrow, and it describes where you are in the painting. Oh, wow. And what we're going to do during the party is you can go up to anybody at the party, and like if you looked at him and you'd say, hey, William, tell me a little bit about yourself. And then he would share a couple sentences about him. Okay. And then you do the same thing. And then you can ask him, well, who are you really? <laughs> and you meet a new friend, OK? OK. okay. And let me, I want to show you where you are in the famous picture and where your, uh, your signatures are in the declaration. All right, so cool. we're going to walk over here. OK, so those are nice attempts. I don't think they'll really be that effective I think a far more effective approach would be to anathematize diversity, all right? Celebrating diversity is celebrating that we have nothing in common, all right? The more diverse, the less in common we have. Diversity effectively means anti-white. So I think we should stop celebrating diversity and instead start celebrating things that we have in common. And these were examples of, you know, celebrating things that we have in common. But uh, perhaps don't make the majority... European Christian population you know, feel like it's going to be overwhelmed. That that's not a good idea because we don't know, you know, how people will react. We don't have any examples in history 
of a majority population that's created their own nation state and then become overwhelmed by outsiders and it wasn't accompanied by a tremendous turmoil and, and bloodshed. So on the other hand, you know, people on the dissident right have usually a, a moronic perspective on this. They, they're all distrustful of institutions. They don't trust the media, and yet they just relentlessly spout inaccurate statistics that are given to them by institutions and the media, such as the U.S. Census says that we're only a 60% white country. So this is how flawed the U.S. Census is, and... If people on the distant right had done, you know, any decent digging, they would understand this. I am one sixteenth Chinese, so I could put on the U.S. Census that I am Asian and that I am Caucasian, and I would be treated by the U.S. Census as one hundred percent Asian. Right? You put down that you're, you know, part black and part white, and let's say you're one sixteenth black and fifteenth sixteenth Caucasians, Caucasian. The U.S. Census will treat you as one hundred percent black. So. U.S. Census figures upon which the news media and other experts make so many of the declarations are flawed. Right? They dramatically understate the European percentage of our population. And the, the dissident right just mindlessly cites, oh, you know, whites are already a minority in much of the United States. They're getting overwhelmed. And they have no understanding about how distorted a picture of the reality of the United States the U.S. Census gives. So if you're going to base your entire life, you're going to base your entire political activism, you're going to base your worldview, you're going to base your politics and your culture and your commitments on something like you know percentages of uh, a population that uh, you identify with, maybe you should learn something about how those percentages are calculated and how relatively accurate or inaccurate they are. And if they're inaccurate, you know, to, to which extent are they understating or are they overstating? All right, so I've been enjoying the podcast, If Books Could Kill. Here is the podcast talking about the awful Thomas Friedman, New York Times foreign affairs columnist, his awful book, The World is Flat. There's definitely a lesson you can learn about mediocrity from Thomas Friedman. It's exactly. just not this one. The fucking New York Times opinion page would be <laughs> right. my first stop on that tour. <laughs> so we can't wrap up a Thomas Friedman episode without talking about the Iraq war. Oh, yeah. I'm going to send you a clip that I know you have seen. Now that the war is over and there's some difficulty with the peace, was it worth doing? Well, I think it was unquestionably um, uh, worth doing, Charlie. I think looking back at the 1990s, I can identify that there are actually three bubbles of the 1990s. Oh, no, three bubbles. There was the Nasdaq bubble. <laughs> Classic Freeman. There was the corporate governance bubble. Lastly, there was what I would call the terrorism bubble. Oh, God. And the first two were based on creative accounting. The last was based on moral creative accounting. What? The terrorism bubble that basically built up over the 1990s said, flying airplanes into the World Trade Center, that's okay. Oh, the Arab mind. Wrapping yourself with dynamite and blowing up Israelis in a pizza parlor, that's okay. And that built up as a bubble, Charlie. And 9-11 to me was the, the peak of that bubble. Peak of that bubble. And what we learned on 9-11 in a gut way was that that bubble was a fundamental threat to our open society. Bubble threat. Because there is no wall high enough, no INS agent smart enough, no metal detector efficient enough to protect an open society from people motivated by that bubble. <laughs> and what we needed to do was go over to that part of the world, I'm afraid, and burst that bubble. And what they needed to see was American boys and girls going house to house from Basra to Baghdad um, and basically saying, which part of this sentence don't you understand? You think this bubble fantasy, we're just going to let it grow? Well, suck on this. He's really cooking there. This is another thing that you wouldn't understand is funny until you've read the whole book. But when he says like <laughs> three bubbles, I was like, Tom, you son of a bitch. <laughs> you've done it again, Tom. <laughs> can't stop him. You can't stop him. At all times, he's thinking of metaphors. But also, it's, it's the same thing where it's completely fucking incoherent what he's saying. He's basically saying like Muslims have a culture of violence. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to go over there and bomb them right. to fix their culture. This clip is somewhat famous because he is literally characterizing the Iraq war not as an effort to oust Saddam yeah, or yeah, yeah, to protect yeah. anyone from WMDs, but to enact revenge on yeah. the Muslim world for fostering illiberal ideas. Yeah. And I think that that was so like revelatory, like he's just sort of putting it on the table and being like, yeah, you know, this was revenge on Muslims. Right. Everyone was sort of like, so you fucking admit it, right? Like, <laughs> because at the time, the justification was all about like saving these populations from their dictator. Exactly. We have to get enough exactly. power to save these people. And it's like, these people are basically fucking animals and we should just like kill them until like they behave better. And keep in mind, this is where Friedman cut his teeth, right? Lebanon, mm. Israel, right. Middle East expertise, ostensibly. Right. Meanwhile, he was, like many pundits, deeply incorrect all the time throughout this era. Like, he, you know, he said the Afghanistan war was over in January 2002. Right. Some highlights from his columns over the years. Ooh. In 
1999, during the bombing of Iraq, he suggested, quote, blowing up a different power station in Iraq every week so no one knows when the lights will go off or who's in charge. Okay, that'll fix it. In 2005, he wrote about Iraq, quote, if they come around, a decent outcome in Iraq is still possible and we should stay to help build it. If they won't, then we are wasting our time. We should arm the Shiites and Kurds and leave the Sunnis of Iraq to reap the wind. Yeesh. A couple months into the Af Afghanistan war, he wrote, quote, think of all the nonsense written in the press, particularly the European and Arab media, about the concern for, quote unquote, civilian casualties in Afghanistan. Quote, unquote. It turns out that many of those Afghan civilians, again in quotations, were praying for another dose of B-52s to liberate them from the Taliban, casualties or not. Oh. A, he's sort of mocking the idea that there were civilian casualties, presumably being like, oh, come on, they were terrorists or something. But yeah. then at the same time, saying that civilians wanted this to happen. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't yeah. make sense. It is like this fundamental contradiction. And all this I bring up because a good chunk of the final chapters of The World of Splat is dedicated to Friedman's belief that the ostensibly insular culture of the Muslim world is a threat to globalization. Wait, really? Yeah. He's got like a Huntington turn at the end? It's in his final uh, chapters titled uh, The Muslim Question. Oh. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be careful, Peter. That actually sounded pretty, uh, pretty real. That actually sounded pretty plausible. Sorry. Um, yeah, he calls, it, he calls the Muslim culture an unflattener. Um, oh my God. And he talks at length about how this is something that the Muslim world needs to reckon with. I, I think that his writing about the Iraq war and about the Middle East and uh, war in general is actually really illuminating because the through line between his war coverage and this book is that his primary goal revolves around retaining American hegemony in the coming century. Right. Like at first glance, you might think that there's a tension or inconsistency here where like this guy is writing about our interconnectedness with the rest of the world, but then he's championing these brutal campaigns of vengeance right. in the Middle East. Right. But I actually think it starts to make sense once you realize that his primary concern is American power. Right. He's, right. he's not writing this book as like a student of technology or something. He's writing it as someone who wants to ensure American supremacy, whether that means funding science education or destabilizing the Middle East. He's also doing a very similar thing to Nudge, where he's pretending to be doing this cool, descriptive project. Like, this is just how human nature works. I'm like, mm -hmm. we should make policy according to human nature. But then once you get into the guts of it, it's like, oh, actually, we should do a bunch of like crazy libertarian shit. Right. Like underneath it is this extremely ideological project. Right. And it seems like he's doing the same thing. Like, I'm just describing how the world is becoming more interconnected. And then whisper voice like, eh, the Muslims are really the problem with this. Right. Like that doesn't follow from the premise at all. No. Um, I mean, he has all of these ideas about like how oh, interne interconnectedness will foster peace in the long term. And then he gets to the section of the book that's like, now let's talk about how Muslims are a big wrench in all of this. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to send you something that is so long. And I'm sorry. Oh, Peter. I can't do the episode unless we say it. And <laughs> you make me go all the way through this fucking excerpt. <laughs> I wanna, I'm going to say something before this. I don't even know if it makes total sense to put it here in, 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 at the end of this episode. Mm -hmm. But... And I want you to listen to what I'm saying because we've read a lot of excerpts here. This is the worst thing in this book. Okay. okay. I have um, a screenshot version of this that is um, the entire page is highlighted because I started trying to <laughs> highlight sections because I was like, well, I don't want him to read all of it. It's too long. And then I just, I realized that I was highlighting all of it. Just kept going. And, and so I was like, well, now it looks stupid. I'm just going to highlight the whole page. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He says, what if regions of the world were like the neighborhoods of a city? What would the world look like? I'd describe it like this. Western Europe would be an assisted living facility with an aging population <laughs> lavishly attended to by Turkish nurses. The United States would be a gated community with a metal detector at the front gate and a lot of people sitting in their front yards complaining about how lazy everyone else was, even though out back there was a small opening in the fence for Mexican labor and other energetic immigrants who helped make the gated community function. Latin America would be the fun part of town, the club district, where the workday doesn't begin until 10 p.m. and everyone sleeps until mid-morning. It's definitely the place to hang out, but in between the clubs, you don't see a lot of new businesses opening up. Except on the street, <laughs> except on the street where the Chileans live. The landlords in this neighborhood almost never reinvest their profits here, but keep them in a bank across town. The Arab street would be a dark alley where outsiders fear to tread, except for a few side streets called Dubai, Jordan, Bahrain, Qatar, and Morocco. The only new businesses are gas stations, whose owners, like the elites in the Latin neighborhood, rarely reinvest their funds in the neighborhood. Many people on the Arab street have their curtains closed, their shutters drawn, and signs on their front lawn that say, no trespassing, beware of dog. <laughs> India, China, and East Asia would be the other side of the tracks. Their neighborhood is a big teeming market made up of small shops and one-room factories, interspersed with Stanley Kaplan SAT prep schools and engineering colleges. Oh, we're like halfway through. <laughs> Nobody ever sleeps in this neighborhood. Everyone lives in extended families, and everyone is working and saving to get to the right side of the tracks. On the Chinese streets, there's no rule of law, but the roads are well paved. On the Indian streets, by contrast, no one ever repairs the streetlights, the roads are full of ruts, but the police are sticklers for the rules. You need a license to open a lemonade stand on the Indian streets. Luckily, the local cops can be bribed, and the successful entrepreneurs have their own generators to run their factories and the latest cell phones to get around the fact that the local telephone poles are all down. Africa, sadly, is that part of town where the businesses are boarded up, life expectancy is declining, and the only new buildings are healthcare clinics. Fucking hell, Peter. <laughs> it's, it's so fucking annoying. It's like, just say what you mean, man. It's not even a metaphor half the time. He's just describing, like, he starts <laughs> off know. with, like, the assisted li living facility and the gated community, and you're like, okay, this is a metaphor, I guess. Right. By the end of it, though, he's just describing the countries yeah. in the African neighborhood life expectancy is declining. Like, <laughs> you don't need the metaphor. Just say life expectancy is declining in Africa. It, it, what God. the fuck is this, dude? Right. And, like, there's no rule of law in the Chinese neighborhood. You're just talking about China. 
<laughs> right, right. You don't need the neighborhood thing for that. And like the Arab Street is a dark alley, <laughs> except for Dubai, Bahrain, right. Qatar, and Morocco. Like this is not you. Stop doing the metaphor, please. Yeah, I think what you said earlier is right. That like it's not clear that he knows how metaphors work. Right. Like metaphors are supposed to simplify situations or like describe the nature of something. To say that like the factory was hell. Yeah. It condenses all of this other information. But if you're gonna say the factory was hell and like hell, it was hot and loud and everybody hated it. You don't need the middleman at that point. You're just describing the factory. The factory was like a neighborhood where my boss was yelling at me all the time. <laughs> Yeah. It's not a metaphor. It's not really a metaphor. Yeah. These are the sorts of like little things that you encounter in Friedman's re writing all of the time, wrapped up in what we haven't even discussed as the most ethnically insensitive yeah, shit I've ever read. Like, are <laughs> you fucking like, kidding me? There's parties in Latin America every night. He literally ripped through every region of the world and was like a little bit rude about all of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, man. This also just like isn't smart. He's just like repackaging conventional wisdom bullshit. I, that's why I thought it was worth ending on it. A, because we have to talk about I it. Mean, so. Okay, so what's going on with Vladimir Putin? We've got 